You may be seated. I'll be looking for that every Sunday from now on. <laughs> You're, you're very welcome. You're very welcome as we gather for our morning service today, and it's a special day as we welcome the moderator of the General Assembly, Dr. Sam Mawinney, and his wife Karen to our congregation today. And we look forward to his ministry of God's Word later on in the service as he speaks to us on his theme of confident in Christ. And as we gather, first and foremost, and uh, we gather to worship God. And Psalm 103 says, Praise the Lord, O my soul. All my inmost being, praise his holy name. Praise the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits. So let's do that as we stand to praise the Lord. The benefits of God come to us through the Lord Jesus Christ. So let's stand and sing, I stand amazed in the presence of Jesus the Nazarene.
Well, that was really great singing. Let's join together now in our prayers. Let's pray. Father, we thank you that your people across the centuries have been people of prayer. We think of, of Daniel. We think of Elijah, who was a man of prayer, just like us. We think of Paul and his prayers for the church. We think of the psalmist that we began our service with today, praying and praising and worshiping you, the Lord who is Lord of all, King of kings. And we thank you that we can say, blessed be the name of the Lord forever and ever. We think how, Lord, you are the one who created time, the seconds, the minutes, the hours, the days, the weeks, the months, the years you have created. And you have told us that we should redeem the time. And Father, we pray that you will forgive us when we waste time. Help us to use time and help us, Heavenly Father, to, to be a people who worship you, the Lord of the years. We thank you, too, that you're the one who sets up kings, the one who sets up governments, and yet also the one who takes them down again. For your providence is at work in history, and you're ruling over current affairs. And sometimes we look at the news or we read the newspaper and we despair for the way the world is going. But we thank you that you're the sovereign, true Lord, and Father, you are in control. We praise you too that not just at the, the, the major level, but also at a small minor level in our lives, you're at work. Your word, a lamp to our feet and a light for our path. Without that word, we're in the dark. We, we're just feeling our way and we don't know will we trip or will we fall over a cliff. But as your word brings us light, it shows us your way. And we thank you that we are not left to guess. We're not left to ourselves. But you come alongside us and we praise you for the Bible that we have and for how this word is able to show us the way to live, to show us Christ, the one who is the guide, the guardian, and the glory of God. We thank you for... Dr. Mawinney being with us today, and we look forward to him opening your word later in our service. And our prayer is that the words of his mouth and the meditation of all our hearts would be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. May we see Christ, may we savor Christ, may we serve him in love, confident that he has loved us that he is the one who is at work in us by the power of his spirit, if we have faith in him. And in him we have redemption. We have reconciliation. We have restoration. And we have hope of reward to come. Father, forgive us our sins. Point us to Jesus. Fill us with the Holy Spirit. And these things we ask and pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So girls and boys, I'm going to, to speak with you at this point in the service, so if you would like to come down to the front, we'll, we'll do that now together. Morning, girls and, morning, girls and boys. And can we say good morning, Dr. Mawinney? <laughs> so he's our guest speaker for today, but you, you'll be probably out at Children's Church um, be, uh, before that. Is the microphone okay? Um, so I'm going to speak to you today, and there's a photograph going to come up here on the screen. I want you to tell me where this is. Okay. Now, where is that? Charlie. Okay, no shouting out, Charlie. It's in the church. What's it called? Robbie. 
Drumrea Presbyterian Church. So on the left, you can see the church. We're, we're in that building on the left. And then on the right, we have, what's the other bit of the church called? Jacob? The halls, okay. And just over a year ago, we opened our new set of halls. And we've got the moderator here today just to, to kind of mark that one year old, our set of halls. So you might say it's, it's the birthday of the set of halls being opened. And we're just going to give, see up on the screen, well, don't, don't show the sixth screen yet. How much do you think the set of halls cost? Somebody have a guess. Jake? A million? A million. You're nearly there. Casey? A million. You're nearly there. One million five hundred. No, not, not one million five hundred thousand. You're away, but it's far too dear. Uh, Leighton? Nope. Daniel? 1.2 is good, but you've just gone a wee bit too high. Zach? 1.1. Okay, so we'll put the screen up. Here we go. So the build cost of the new halls was 1.1 million. That's a lot of money, isn't it? Um, we have paid back 1 million. So who's, who's good at reading the bottom one? What's, what's left to pay back? What's left to pay back? A girl, any of the girls? Girls haven't put up their hands yet. The girls, uh, right. One hundred thousand. Okay, thank you, Jacob. Um, now, so we're, we're really thankful uh, that one million has been paid back. Could I say Dromore con 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 congregation contributed a quarter of a million? And we're going to have a special service for Dromore later on, just in January time. Um, they've written a history of their congregation, and we're going to have a special service for that. So we've repaid a million, and we're really grateful for what uh, Dromore gave, and also really grateful for what the congregation gave us. God has moved people's hearts, and we have got all these, these buildings. Now, here's, here's a photograph. Where's this? Where's this? What, what's this room called, Gabriella? The Minor Hall. Okay, that's the Minor Hall, where your Sunday school starts. You were in there this morning. Yep. Next one. Where's that? Kitchen, thank you. Roseanne, Rosanna, thank you. Where's this? Uh, Willow, the crash, okay. Uh, the football hall. Football hall. <laughs> Jonah, the main hall, yep, okay. Um, where's this? Somebody hasn't? Upstairs. Sarah? <laughs> the upper room upstairs, okay. And there's the door with the upper room on it. And I think there's one more. And you've been in that room already. Where's that? Sunday. Robbie? Sunday school. Sunday school rooms. And you go down that corridor and there's room, 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 right the way down that corridor. And I've, I've been thinking, I've got a list here. What do you hear this? Can we go back to the main hall? No. <laughs> we can. There's the main hall, okay? You see in the last year, here's some of the things that have happened in the main hall in the last year and have filled it. There was an open day when it first opened and a gospel mission for a week. We've had a barbecue. We've had presbytery youth rallies. We had a BB tug of war. Anybody in the BB tug of war? Who's anybody in the BB team? And we won it. Okay. There was a GB pudding party. There were sad times. There was funerals, uh, teas held in it. Happy times, like a table quiz, a youth club, fun days, and just two weeks ago there was a wedding reception. So those are all events that have happened in the big hall. Now can we go back to the one that says upper room, please? No. We can. Now, there's the upper room. I want to think about the word room for a moment. Okay? Let's think about the word room. Room. That's a word we don't use. A room or a space, okay? Do you remember whenever Jesus came, was born in Bethlehem, why did he have to be born in a stable? Because there was no room. There was no room for him in the... Jake? In the hotel. There was no room for him in the inn. Yeah. When Jesus came, there was no room for him. People said, we don't want you. There's nowhere, you don't fit in. 
there's no space. So, so they said to Jesus, there was no room for him in the inn. And many people today still say to Jesus, sorry, we have no room for you. We, we don't want you in our life. Keep out. Many, many people do that, and they just say, they just say no to Jesus. And then at the end of Jesus' life, does anybody know where the upper room was at the end of Jesus' life? Not, not this upper room. There was another upper room. Charlie. Not heaven, no. Anybody else? Leighton? Not the cross. Just before the cross, when Jesus had the last supper, he had the last supper with his friends in the upper room. It wasn't Jesus' house, because he didn't own a house, but someone had loaned them a room. It was up, why do you think it was called the upper room? It was up high or it was up? Upstairs. Okay. So Jesus was, was, was in that room with the 12 disciples and they had the Passover meal together in that place. In other words, somebody welcomed Jesus. We don't know who that person was that owned the house, but they said, they opened the doors, they opened the, the room, and they said, you can have this room. And girls and boys, there are people in this world who close Jesus out and there are people who open their hearts and say, come in. You're either one or the other. You've either closed the door on Jesus or you've opened the door on Jesus and you've said, come in. Come in, Lord, to my life. Take over. Save me from my sins and help me to live your way from now on. And we're going to sing now about some people who did that, who didn't close God out of their lives, but who opened their hearts to God. And the, first, and the children's hymn, and we're all going to stand now and sing this. Have you heard about the boy in the multicolored coat? Who was that? Joseph. Joseph. Okay. And he was someone who was on the side of God. He didn't close God out. He opened his heart to God. And let's stand and sing about him and others.
Well, it is lovely to see you here today at our service, and a few announcements just before we, we move on to pray for others. Um, after the service, there's tea and coffee um, for everyone, and if you're able to stay just out in the meet and greet area, um, please do so, and the moderator and his wife will be there as well. So we've always wanted to ask the moderator of the General Assembly a question. This is your chance. This is your opportunity. He'll be there, and uh, you can make your way and uh, talk to him and to his wife, Karen. Evening service tonight is at half six, and I hope to be preaching at that tonight. And the prayer time is at six beforehand. At Monday night, the prayer meeting is at eight. Wednesday, we continue our series on basic building blocks at our midweek at eight o'clock. And we're all gonna be asking this week, is God a force or is God a person? How do we know there is a God? And what sort of a presence is he? And we'll be looking at, at questions like that on Wednesday as we just think about who God is. Then on Thursday, we're going to go out and do some door-to-door -door work, giving out leaflets, um, advertising the harvest services next Sunday, and also giving out those blue leaflets with details of all our children's and youth organizations. If you'd like to come and help, we're going to do Bandura and Balnamore um, and Up the Vow. Um, 6.30, just meet at the front of the church here, um, and if you'd like to come, we'd really love, love you to come, um, and uh, just a way of outreach, and we'd love just to do that, and just to uh, go out into the local community. Next Sunday is Harvest Sunday, and it's at half 11 and 6.30 as usual, and it's a great opportunity to invite someone along. Um, I hope to be preaching at both services and there will be harvest displays to view as well. And the offering, uh, the little uh, property envelopes are in your box. If, you have, if you're a, a member, you'll have a box of envelopes. Please use the property envelope in that for the uh, offering. And uh, there will also be special property envelopes free uh, on the table also uh, if you want to give to the property fund. Um, if you want to help with harvest displays, um, then non-perishable items can be left in the church from th on Thursday between 7 and 9 in the evening, and any perishables on Saturday morning between 9 and 11. And if you want to help with setting up for harvest, then come along at 9 on Saturday morning, and you will be most welcome. It's also food bank, uh, giving to the food bank next Saturday as well, next Sunday as well. And lastly, the Wycliffe uh, Bible Translators magazine has come through for November. Um, if you want one of those, um, please take them. There's a pile of them on the way out, and then their prayer diary as well, just to pray for the work of Wycliffe, which translates the scriptures into uh, languages uh, across the world. So let's join together in prayer, and uh, let's just seek the Lord's blessing. Let's pray on others. Father, as we again uh, come in prayer, we do want to give thanks for the halls complex we have enjoyed so much using over the past year. We thank you for the photographs that have reminded us of all that is in the hall complex and how they've been used, um, not just the main hall, but also the upper room and the Sunday school rooms, the kitchen, the creche. And we thank you for, for, for just the, the many ministries that are using the halls and seeking to uh, reach out in the name of Christ. And Father, you've blessed us, and we want to say thank you today. And we pray that the halls in the future might be used as an outreach space, as a refuge, as a welcoming space, as a resource in many ways perhaps we cannot foresee. And most of all, we pray as a place for the preaching of the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. Lord, we thank you for where we are at a year after the halls have been opened, and we look to you to continue to meet our need, and we bless you for the generosity of your people, and we thank you, Father, for how we are in the position that we are in today. But we know that others are not so well off, and we think of the Middle East, and we have been horrified by what has erupted uh, on the, and the scale of the suffering and the death that has been uh, aff afflicting that area uh, of our world. And it's our prayer today, Lord, that you would have mercy upon the people who are caught up in that conflict. It's our prayer that 
punishment would be brought upon those who have been guilty of atrocities. And it's our prayer that peace would descend upon the region and that many people would be motivated by hope and not by hate, that swords would be beaten in the plowshares and spears would be beaten in the pruning hooks. And we also today, Lord, pray for those who are facing personal difficulties, thinking of those who are perhaps caught up with family woes or marital distress, those who are weeping over rebellious children or worrying about money, those who spend sleepless nights battling fear and anxiety, and those who are being sucked into a black hole of depression, others acquainted with sorrow and with grief. Father, we pray for people today whose lives are afflicted in different ways, praying that they might know the experience of the prophet who said, when you pass through the waters, I will be with you. When you pass through rivers, they will not overwhelm you. When you walk through fire, you will not be burned. The fire will not consume you. For I am the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel, your Savior. Lord, remember those today who are in need, wherever they are. And yes, Lord, we are thankful for, the, for, for being given so much. But we know that others, Lord, their lives are in turmoil. And we pray for them today that they might find you, the God of order, even in their chaos. We pray these things and ask them in Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to sing again, and uh, we have an extra hymn today, and it's the hymn, Rejoice. It's, it's the hymn, uh, Rejoice. Isn't that it? It's just Rejoice. Yeah, Rejoice in the Lord now and always. Sing it again. We rejoice.
Well, we're going to read from the book of Psalms this morning, from Psalm number one. And uh, just before I, I do that, could I again just say a word of welcome to Dr. Mawinney um, as he comes today uh, to preach to us God's word. Um, for those of you who maybe don't know, um, Dr. Mawinney is uh, a member, was originally from the Root Presbytery, from Valley Castle Congregation, and uh, has been the minister in the south of Ireland, really, for your whole ministry, and currently the minister of Adelaide Road in Dublin. So we're delighted you're here today. Um, Sam and I were uh, same year at Union Theological College back in the day, and uh, here we are today. Um, so you're very welcome, and uh, we do look forward to your message, which is going to be on, based on Psalm 1. So Psalm number 1, let us hear the word of God. Blessed is the man who does not walk in the counsel of the wicked, or stand in the way of sinners, or sit in the seat of mockers. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and on his law he meditates day and night. He is like a tree planted by streams of water, which yields its fruit in season, and whose leaf does not wither. Whatever he does prospers. Not so the wicked. They are like chaff that the wind blows away. Therefore the wicked will not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the assembly of the righteous. For the Lord watches over the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked will perish. Amen. And we thank God for the reading of his word. So just before Dr. Mawinney speaks, we are going to sing, prepare our hearts uh, with that lovely chorus, show us Christ.
Well, folks, it is a delight to be with you and uh, to share with you in your worship today. Um, thank you to the praise band for leading us so well. Some of those songs I didn't know, but the words were great. And I kind of feel the pressure after that prayer. I don't know about preaching um, and that you might be listening for the voice of Christ, and that is a good thing, uh, and it is good to be with you this morning. Uh, as Richard said, our year was a great year. Um, so the two of us were in that year, and it has produced uh, lots of ministers, and we really enjoyed that time. And it's good to be with you and to bring you greetings. And firstly, I do that on behalf of the General Assembly. Um, really, that's like saying a big hello from the wider church. And I have that authority, as it were, just to do that. Um, and just to say to you that you are valued. Um, you are part of uh, the Presbyterian Church in Ireland and you are uh, obviously some, uh, part of something much bigger. And uh, I do want to just say hello, as it were, uh, from the Presbyterian Church widely to you as well. Um, I, as you heard, came from Ballycastle. Um, my main contact with Drumrea was through the BB. I have to say that you were very good at marching. Um, and we in Ballycastle didn't really like to march and so you always won the competitions, and I don't know where we finished, but we were always in those as well. So you were good at PE as well, um, and I think the only thing perhaps we were slightly better at was at football, though you might dispute that as well. So it was good, and that's how we kind of got to know um, Drumrea at that time as well. And folks, I am just blown away, uh, both by the numbers of people here and, and also by uh, this building and the suite of halls that you have. You are to be congratulated, um, and I'm sure that you're very proud um, of this suite of buildings that you have here. Um, and yet that is, as it were, the easy part. Um, that is the easy part of having this magnificent suite of buildings, uh, because what is much more difficult, of course, is to build a community and to build the family of God and to move towards each other and to love the Lord Jesus with all your heart and to move towards him. And so I commend you uh, for what you have done and do want to just encourage you to keep doing uh, what you're doing. I was also very struck when I was sitting there as well about the difference in cultures. Uh, so whenever um, uh, I was, you stood up for me to come in, whenever I was an assistant minister in Belfast and I went to uh, a little primary school, uh, all the children stood up and said, good morning, Reverend Mawinney. And it was all very respectful. And then when I went to work in the County Cork in Fermoy, I went into the little primary school there and the kids were all doing their work. And they all looked up and they said, hi, Sam. <laughs> and that kind of showed me that there's a difference in thinking, a difference in culture in that way. And uh, yeah, it's just good to be back among the respectful and uh, the disciplined as it were. Folks, we do want to look at this psalm together, um, and we're going to just go through it in a moment or two. I suppose I just want to set the scene for you. Um, I have worked in the Republic of Ireland for the last 25 years. Um, I was sent to a town called Clonmel um, in County Tipperary. It was a county town. I arrived on the All-Ireland final weekend, and Tipperary were in the hurling final, and the whole town was bedecked in blue and gold. It's the colors of Tipperary, and um, called the Premier County. Fantastic farming county, by the way, as some of you will already know, the Golden Vale and all those beautiful farms that are down there. And then I moved to Fermoy in North Cork, again, a, a garrison town. That is why the Presbyterians are there, uh, because the Scottish regiments uh, came over uh, at the time of, uh, you know, the early, eight, the late 1800s and set up these garrisons in these significant towns because uh, Fermoy is on a river and it's the main route from, uh, from Cork up and so it was a place where they could control um, and uh, that's why the Presbyterian Church was founded there. When I went there, I found in those days what I would describe as a, a God-fearing culture. Um, a Catholic culture, of course, but God-fearing. Uh, people were respectful of the church. They were respectful of me. Uh, they were respectful of the message that we had as well. 
And then, of course, I moved to Dublin. Um, and that was such a significant change. I kind of struggled with that for a while, but I'm now living and working in the center of Dublin. It is secular. It's post-Christian. And actually, the folks are very hostile to the church. And most of us would not be wearing collars in the south. Even the priests take their collars off uh, in Dublin because of what's going on. And the speed of change, as I've said, is in the past is really significant. Those building blocks of marriage have been done away with, uh, the things that we believe about marriage. Um, the repeal of the Eighth Amendment, abortion is now legal in the Republic. And so you have this sort of sense of flux and of difficulty and of the struggle. And I suppose what that did as well is that it allowed people who were kind of questioning the church. They were part of the church, but they were, you know, they were questioning it now. And they were able to ask their questions. They were able to criticize what they never really understood. They were able to say, I don't believe that anymore. I think you're wrong. And actually that has moved to perhaps an intolerance of people who don't believe what they believe. And it's become more difficult, isn't it, to express contrary views. And then, of course, people started to leave the church. And, of course, that affects not just the Roman Catholic Church, but all the churches. And we, so we have this culture of, of opposition and of criticism and of difficulty. So I don't know how good or bad it is in Balamone. I'm surprised that you've got three Presbyterian churches in Balamone, and you've got a church out the road a couple of miles as big as this. It's just a different culture. But I'm sure that you are feeling some of the pressures that we are feeling in the center of Dublin, and I want to speak to you about that. Folks, it's easier, isn't it, to keep your head down? It's easier to cower. That's the name that I'm putting in that, C-O-W-E-R, cower. In other words, we, we come on a Sunday, we're encouraged, we're blessed. How good it is to be here, by the way. And yet when we go out there, it's different. It's different in schools. It's different in your society. It's different even in the supermarket at times. It's just different. And so what we do is that we just keep ourselves to ourselves. We cower. And sometimes it's easier then to adjust your faith. That's what a lot of people have done in the Republic of Ireland. In other words, I believe in Jesus, but I, I don't think he's right about marriage. I don't think he's right about giving. I don't think he's right about how we should live our lives. But I do believe in Jesus. And so we change what we think. So we call that compromise, don't we? So we don't believe the historical doctrines of the Bible any longer. We don't think in the way that we used to think. And so we compromise. And that's what people have been doing as well. And we've seen it within our own denomination as well. And folks, it is easier now to question what you believe because everybody's doing it and to walk away, to come to church when it suits you, to do the things that you want to do in your own particular way. And so you've kind of, as it were, capitulated and you've caved in and you've just done what you want to do yourselves. And folks, when people do that, then we see the symptoms of what happens when you walk away from the Lord because we don't see freedom, we see enslavement. We see the deterioration in society, not its upbuilding. And those symptoms are not hard to find. That's the symptoms that we see. What are those kind of symptoms? We see that people have many personal problems. They don't know how to navigate life. We see that they're tired all the time. We see that they're full of stress. We see that they're taking medication to help them through their day. We see this drugs issue, which I've been hearing about since I've come to Belfast, and how it's overwhelming because they don't know how to cope. We see sleeplessness, and we dis see despair, and we see our institutions. And we see it, it, so often that they are deteriorating and difficult. So, after that negative introduction, I want to encourage you because I do believe that that is something that we need to understand about being confident in Christ with. Psalm 1 contrasts that, doesn't it? It, it paints out a picture, a beautiful picture of an evergreen tree or chaff on one side. Those are the two pictures, the evergreen tree in verse 3 
and the chaff that blows away in verse 4. It is a wisdom psalm. It's the beginning of the Psalter, and it offers advice on how to navigate life. In other words, how to be blessed, or I'm going to say how to be confident in Christ. So if you have your Bibles, let's open it, and let's ask that God would help us to see what we're to do. So let me pray. Father, we thank you that we have gathered here to worship you. We thank you for this magnificent building. And Father, we do pray that as we hear your word, that you would move among us by your power, the power of your Holy Spirit. And that, Father, that you would raise up within us a deep confidence in Jesus Christ, a real relationship with him that will enable us to live well in the society that is around us for his glory and to bring men and women and boys and girls to know him as Lord and Savior. And we pray and ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. So firstly, we see in verses 1 and 2 the direction of the believer's life. Um, I used to do, I did a, an outreach once, and we had these T-shirts, and they had fish on them, and it said, against the flow. And so all the fish were going in one direction, but there was this different colored fish going in the other direction. That is what this is talking about. And if you read it, it says, blessed is the man who does not do this or do that or do that. It's the blessing comes from not doing something negatively. And we're not to walk in the, we know, take the advice of the wicked. We're not to follow the lifestyle of the sinner. And we're not to participate with those who openly are opposed to God. And they're very strong descriptions, aren't they? The wicked, sinners, and mockers. And it applies to people, people that you will meet every day. And the point is, of course, that some of those people will be hostile, and some of those people will be nice. They will in involve all sorts of people. It's a way of the Bible describing those who do not have a relationship with God. People who do not acknowledge the Lord, God as the Lord, and who do not recognize Him. They can be indifferent, they can be hostile, but in their hearts they reject Him, and they do not follow Him. And that is the default of the human heart. You and I know that, because that's what we were before we were converted. It's in our nature, isn't it, to say, I'm not doing that, Lord. It's in our nature to resist the Holy Spirit prompting us. That is what we are by nature. Our thoughts are not His thoughts. Our ways are not His ways. And when we recognize that, and we recognize that that's what we were, then we understand that that temptation is very strong in these people, the wicked, the sinners, and the mockers. It's because of the ongoing presence of sin in their hearts, and their struggle is a, re is a real struggle to go against the flow. And we are not to do that because we have been changed by the Lord. And we see that every day, don't we? We see it with our young people because their information that they're getting every day is not coming from the Scriptures. It's coming from the television. It's coming from the Internet. It's coming from their phones. It's coming from their peers. And they're going to hear this counsel, aren't they? They're going to see people who walk in a particular way. They're going to hear people who are against the Lord. And it's hard to stand up against it. And much of it, uh, we need to do that, don't we, in terms of how they, they will do that, in terms of their identity, in terms of their sexuality. Um, our boys, one of our boys was particularly good at sport, and so he was uh, playing at a very high level. And that whole culture of alcohol and what they do with alcohol. And how are we going to get them to stand up against that? We are not to walk in that counsel. We'll come back to that. Do you see what it's saying? So it's saying they will hear this. And, and we have to say, well, don't do it. But we have to find out a way to tell them how to do, not to do it. That's the difficult part. In work again, if I were, I suppose, speaking in the city, I might be talking to you about personal pronouns and how you how you relate to people in the office. Perhaps for you as a farming community, I might want to talk to you about the climate change. I might want to talk to you about farming issues of 
production and overproduction. I might want to talk to you about Loch Ness and the green algae and all of those kind of things and how it relates to each one of us in that. What does it mean to be honest in the reporting and the forms that you fill in? What does it mean to follow the advice of government? How do we do that? What about overwork and how we deal with those whole situations as well? You see, because we're told certain things, we're told to go in a certain way, and we need to be careful that it's not the way, that it's against the way of the Lord. So, folks, direction is important. Not going in the direction of the world is necessary. And the blessing that comes to the person who is careful not to go in that way. So that's what you're not to do. But how are you not to do it? That's what he says in verse 2. His delight is to be in the law of the Lord. And on the law he meditates day and night. I don't know if any of you have got an Amazon dot, an Alexa. You got an Alexa? Do you ever say please to Alexa? I struggled with that when I first got my Alexa. I used to say, RTE Radio 1, please. And then I thought, hmm, it's not a person. This Alexa has a girl's name, but it's not a person. And therefore, we have to see that God here is personal. If you look in your Bibles, it should have the Lord in capital letters. I, I tell the story. I don't know if, I've, if Richard's heard this story before, but uh, we had a Hebrew professor, Richard and I. His name was Professor MacIver. So I got a homework back from Professor MacIver once, and it had red writing all over it. Any teachers here? Every word, every line had red writing on it. There was like little arrows everywhere, and then there was a big screed at the bottom in red. And I had misspelt the name of the Lord. I'd got my pointing wrong for Yahweh. So every time I'd written Yahweh in my homework, it was wrong. And he wrote at the bottom in his dry humor, he said, the Lord likes to have his name spelt correctly. And I thought, wow, yes, he's right, because the Lord is personal. Whenever you go to the south of Ireland and your name is Mawinney, you have to spell it every time, every time, because they don't know how to spell it and because it's important to you. And I suppose I just want to say that we have to recognize the personhood of God. So how do you not follow the way of those who are not God's people? Well, you do it by recognizing that He is a personal being, that He is real. And we see the reality of that. We, we counteract the reality of society by loving Him and by knowing Him and by wanting to spend time in His Word. And the only person who did that perfectly was Jesus Christ. And his life is just brilliant, isn't it? He loved people. He loved the Scriptures. He spent time praying. He spoke boldly. He was not worldly at all. He gave himself to people, and his life was the most attractive life that was ever lived. And he did it because he knew this word inside out, and he lived it. Folks, never let anyone tell you that being a Christian is boring. Never let anyone tell you that following the Lord is detrimental to your well-being. Let no one tell you that it's detrimental to your way of life, because Jesus disproves that. And the direction of blessing and confidence is always towards God. It means walking in the counsel of God. It means standing and sitting with the righteous. It means coming to church. It means chatting about Jesus to each other. I was really heartened, and I have spoken about this before, about the work that Mel Lacey is doing, um, and she wrote about it in the Presbyterian Herald. And that's something that we've got to think hard about. How are we going to get our young people to be able to stand up to Jesus? We're not just going to get it if they come to meetings and go home. We've got to get alongside them. We've got to talk to them about Jesus. We've got to talk through these issues with them. We've got to increase their knowledge of the Bible. It's about more of the Scriptures, not less of the Scriptures. It's about knowing Jesus better, not about just entertaining them. That is how they're going to stand. So the direction of a believer's life is towards God who is personal. It is to delight in Him and His Word. And if we do that, it will inevitably mean that we swim against the flow of the world. 
That's what he's saying in verse 1 and 2. And then he describes the, the believer's life in verses 3 and 4. And again, that is, uh, the pictures just paint the picture. So you just need to see the picture of the evergreen tree, and you need to see the picture of the chaff that blows away. So again, just to explain to you that um, a little bit about where I live in Dublin, and because uh, many people don't know this, that Dublin has three rivers. Can you tell me one of the rivers? The Liffey. Yes, very good. Anybody know any of the other two? I didn't think you did, and I didn't know them either, but there we go. So on the north side, you have the Tolka River. In the middle, you have the Liffey. And then where I live, you have on the south side, you have the Dodder River. If you walk along the Dodder River, you see these magnificent weeping willows. They are just brilliant because they are close to the water. They are vibrant. They are verdant because of that water. And that is the description that's given here, a metaphor of life. So it's telling us the person who is stable, in other words, planted, they have vitality, that's by streams of water, they are productive, they yield their fruit, they are durable, their leaf does not wither, they prosper, a summary, a summary highlighting the idea of flourishing. And the Psalms fill their person, of course, in, their fulfillment, of course, in the person of Jesus. Again, you're just seeing Jesus here. You're seeing the beauty of his life and the wonder of his life. And it's not about material prosperity. This is not about just having all these good things because Jesus' life is the corrective to that. He had no house. He had no riches. And yet the value of his life and ministry are incalculable. And so this picture in verse 3 is, is great, and it's connected to a series of promises, isn't it? Uh, promises of a relationship with God which are staggering, uh, of fruitfulness, of long-lasting, and of being prosperous. Folks, the best way to do that is just to tell you stories of people, and I want to share just three quick stories, because this is what I believe that God can do when we trust Him. And I've seen it even in people in church who are not like this, even though because they're not applying the Word of God. So I'm thinking of a lady who, whenever she went to university, was so nervous, in a sense so anxious, that she just couldn't cope. And she wasn't able to finish her course at university. But then she discovered a relationship with Jesus. And she discovered not just the relationship with Jesus, but, that, but by knowing the Scriptures and applying them to those issues of her life of worry and anxiety and fear and all of those things, that she saw that God changed her heart. She repented of those, and she had more and more of Christ in her, in her life. She has written books today. She leads up a counseling ministry, and she speaks in public with great authority because God has transformed her life. That's what He loves to do. I'm thinking of a lady who came to our church in Adelaide Road, and she was a polio sufferer. So, and what happens with that, of course, she went into, she got worse, she couldn't walk for a while, and then she had to go into a wheelchair, Then her neck muscles began to weaken so that she needed a brace. And that's why she was coming to us, because we were city center, and it was much closer to where she was. I have never met such a joyful, can-do Christian. She was a disability advocate, she wrote poetry, she knew where she was going, and she, had, she, had, she knew that one day she would die, but she was not afraid. And she had this incredible attitude and joy because this is what happens when we trust God and let His Word dwell in our hearts. I think of an alcoholic, someone who was addicted and in a, in a medical background, which was my background. You see those effects, don't you? You see that their skin is not as good as it should be. You see that perhaps their muscles are wasted. That you can see the scars, as it were, of those addictions. But when they know the Lord and they trust Him, you see that transformation of their character. You see what really matters when that happens in their life. That is what is going on here. And I think to some extent I've seen it in my own life as well, as God has transformed me and made me more and more like Jesus. Much, much more to do. But that is what he's in the business of doing. And so I just want to encourage you to, to think about that and to see the contrast with the wicked, because that's how he does it. He doesn't, doesn't labor where, what happens to them. 
He just says, look, their lives are of no consequence. There's no substance there. They, are, they don't count in the long run, as it were. And they ultimately just get blown away. It's a, it's a sad picture. And we need to see the sadness of that because we don't want to be there. We want to be this fruitful reality. And so the picture of turning away from the influence of sinners and turning to the delight and instructions of God is an evergreen, fruitful tree planted by a constant stream of fresh water. And the outcome for the believer is a faithful, fruitful, confident Christian life that is more and more like Jesus every day. And then to finish, we see the destiny of the believer in verses 5 and 6. If you go back to my original illustration, you've got all these fish heading in this direction, and there's one fish going in the other direction. Um, I don't actually know where I'm at, but let's say one takes you to Balamuni, and the other takes you to Coleraine or Limavati, I'm not quite sure, but there you go. So you end up in different directions. That's what he's saying here, isn't it? The destination is outlined in verses 5 and 6. Therefore, the wicked will not stand in the judgment. In other words, they don't have Jesus as their advocate nor the sinners in the assembly of the righteous. They don't belong in the church. They don't belong in heaven. For the Lord watches over the way of the righteous and the way of the wicked will perish. One will go to eternity. We sang those beautiful words. You have the words of eternal life. And one will go to a destiny without Jesus in hell forever. There is no justification. There is no communion with believers. And yet our, our destination is different. That is what sustains us, isn't it? Because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ even when we were dead in transgressions. It is by grace you have been saved, and God raised us up with him in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus in order that in the coming ages he might show the incomparable riches of his grace expressed in his kindness to us in Jesus Christ. That is our destination. We are a people of hope. We are a people who know where we're going. We are a people with a roadmap to take us there and a person to help us get us there. We will stand in the judgment. We will sit in the assembly of the righteous because of the imputation of Christ's righteousness. We will not perish because of the gift of eternal life in Jesus Christ our Lord. So Psalm 1 is this important and vital song of life. It teaches us that life lived in relationship with God is about blessing and flourishing. And such a life begins with an acceptance of the gospel, and it continues with daily delighting in God, listening to his instruction and following his ways. So let me encourage you in that direction of travel. I suppose just to leave you with two things. Move towards God. Love him in his word and move towards each other. I know I'm here at this first anniversary of your halls. Let's not glory in the halls. Let's glory in one another. Let's glory in meeting one another and moving towards one another. Because what this society needs is to see a community that works. A community that's all age as you are. A community that's probably all um, abilities as you are. A community that's got you know, rich people and poor people, but at the end of the day, we love Jesus and we're united in that. That is what we're to do. And what is our reassurance? We get it in the very last verse. I love these little words. The Lord watches over the way of the righteous. God is watching over you. Um, you he is like a parent, isn't he? Watching over their child. I usually try and get in a reference to the fact that I'm a Manchester City supporter. Um, so therefore, I have been since I was a, a, a young boy, so it's not that I've jumped on the bandwagon. But why are we such a good team? Not just because we have the money, but because we have a really good coach. Someone who knows what they're doing. His name is Pep Guardiola. But I want to say to you folks that you have, you have a father, you have the, the almighty God, you have the Lord Jesus Christ, you have the Holy Spirit, and he watches over you. He watches over you, and he longs to bring you to him, and he wants to bring you, of course, to eternal life in heaven. So a life lived in relationship with God is blessed and will flourish. A life lived without relationship to God will 
flounder. And folks, that is our confidence. Our confidence is in Christ. And we can be confident that he will do what he says. Let us pray. Father, what a privilege it is just to come into your house, to this meeting house, to meet with you and to meet with one another. And Father, we thank you for the wisdom of the psalm. We thank you for how we see the beauty of the Lord Jesus in its words. And I pray, Father, that we will be convinced in our hearts of the good work that you want to do in each of our hearts as you build us up to be the community of your people here in Drumrea, reaching out to this community. And that, Father, that we will move towards you and that we will move towards each other in the confidence that the psalm promises. And we pray and ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, Dr. Mawinney, for your encouraging, encouraging message. And our closing hymn just picks up on that. In Christ alone, my hope is found. It, it's about being planted, being saved as being planted in the Lord Jesus Christ. That's where our safety is found. That's where our salvation is found. That's where our strength is found when we're, we're trusting in Christ. So let's stand and sing about the joy of that. And maybe you don't have that. Then look to Christ and be found in him today.
after the closing prayer, please remain standing as the moderator leaves. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for our service this morning, and we thank you for this, this time of worship. And as we leave, we pray that the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit would be with us all today and evermore.